All right, let's uh, jump into <clears throat> John chapter 12. So we're in a, a series in Ephesians chapter 1. That's why we're jumping into John <laughs> chapter 12. How do you like that? So we uh, we left off, so you just have to go back to YouTube to see, you know, kind of pick up on the, on the uh, <clears throat> previous <clears throat> iterations of the series. But uh, John chapter 12 is where we left off with Jesus uh, giving us a little... Yeah, kind of parable-like um, saying here, but he says, 12, 24, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears <clears throat> much fruit. So we were looking last week at this progression of, of uh, the surrendered life or the planted life uh, <clears throat> towards understanding what it is to be ab absolutely surrendered. And that gives us this picture of what Paul would talk about in Romans chapter 6 and, and verse 4 is to walk in newness of life. Or how do we get there? How do we get to a life that he describes as newness? Uh, so we have this life, but are we walking it in, in newness? Or what is it to walk in newness of life? Or what Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 10 <clears throat> with that adverb, abundantly. We have this life, but are we living it abundantly? What Peter talks about <clears throat> in terms of possessing inexpressible joy with could probably put that in there as well. And then to be filled with the fullness of God, uh, Ephesians 3, 17. Here, um, this this added uh, John chapter 12 and verse uh, 24 within that whole context. <clears throat> For example, I should say backing up just a ver uh, verse, uh, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So living uh, or to be planted then <clears throat> for the glory of God. Maybe we'd include that um, as well. So um, we looked at kind of a, a progression of, of a few things. We won't review those, but just the fourth one then, this idea of let's just kick some dirt over this soil. You know, the soil being a living thing then um, that, that is planted in the ground, <clears throat> but leaving the hand. Um, and then here, uh, this, this soil uh, covering covering and I think this gives us uh, <clears throat> this idea of um, the necessary transformation that that takes pe place I would keep keep in mind second uh, Corinthians 318 with this because we're, we're speaking we're, we're talking about a, a physical Jesus of course describing a physical process of a seed that's going into the ground and what's going to happen to that seed is it transformed then we're looking at a spiritual transformation just to remind us of 2 Corinthians 3.18 where Paul says, But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same, same image. So the Spirit of God gives us uh, the ability to see, that is, uh, to see the finished product. In other words, to see the fin finished product, but what enables us to... Um, uh, apprehend this in such a way that uh, we are able to align our, our behavior uh, drawing from his his strength to do that uh, which which he's saying are, are being transformed <clears throat> we're not transforming ourselves so this is an important distinction which we'll see <clears throat> you know very soon are being transformed so this is a uh, uh, a passive response to an active influence, you know, always in the case of the Christian life, we are yielding to the Spirit's power in our life into the same image from glory to glory in ever-increasing glory, just as from the Lord, the, the Spirit. <clears throat> so um, here is a sense uh, that this is this uh, idea that um, we are, I, I, I guess this is in concert with the life of faith uh, most, most vividly. Uh, for example, uh, writer of the book of Hebrews in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, and I'm noting... I'm noting here, uh, verse 8, by Abraham, for example, just to cite Abraham, by, uh, by faith Abraham, 
when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was, where, where he was going. Um, we're just citing this as an example. So this idea that the, here the seeds going into the ground, it's going to be it's going to be covered and it's going to be transformed. So, so I, I guess in terms of actual experience, this this uh, coming to terms with our our death, you know, this this sort of uh, surrendered life, yielding over the self life. Uh, dying to self in this in this sense uh, the the giving over of, of self or however you're understanding this risking all on the promises of God I'm not suggesting that this is an, an easy thing or suggesting that uh, transitioning from from one way of, of living to another is an easy thing is if you look just look at the some of the examples here in Hebrews chapter 11, I think you'd have to look at, look at this chapter an entirely different way perhaps, uh, because it's illustrative of, of this life of faith. But here's this principle of faith, you know, by faith Abraham, and the idea not knowing where he was going. And try to wrap your head around that a, a little bit. So imagine Abraham, it's not so much directionally. He gets on a road and I don't know where I'm going. You know, that, that this is the point here. I think the point is a little deeper than that, a lot deeper than that, but that you have a, a polytheist. This is Abraham. He's a polytheist until encountering the God of the Bible and migrating based on the direction of an unseen influence. So if... <laughs> Like, like if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, and you have very little on this, by the way. So you have to appreciate really Abraham, but Genesis chapter 12, and you get, now the Lord said to Abraham, this is all you have. Here's Abraham, a polytheist, which means somebody who's worshiping more than one God. This is his uh, worldview uh, in the ancient Near East. And now the Lord said to him, he doesn't have a Bible to read. He doesn't have any of this, except somehow the Lord communicates this to him. And you don't have a lot of context prior to that uh, about God and any disclosure to, to Abraham. It just has something about Abram with his family and migrating here and there. And now the Lord said to him, go forth out of your country from your relatives, your father's house to the land, which I will show you and so on. So I, I, I think we just give insufficient attention <clears throat> to really plumbing the depths of Abraham's faith. So, so here's a man who's, who's ready to, to make this major transition in his life to actually leave one region and when you're saying this, I mean, I suppose today you think, well, what would that be? You know, get a truck, put my possessions in it, and off I go down the road. But we're talking about a guy with massive holdings and a whole family and generations and, and so on, all this stuff, and, and off off you go. Um, this is an, an incredible uh, transition for Abraham. I, I think nonetheless for an individual uh, to, to be able to transition from living life a, a certain way, a, a very rational way, uh, by what they see, feel, taste, touch, smell, and everything sensory to living in terms of their physical wits and things like this in a, in a very material world, to then having to come to terms with a spiritual reality of a new birth and, and, and uh, the spiritual dynamics of how um, this this new life in Christ functions. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I, I, here, here's Abraham, no scriptures, no religious system of beliefs, no assembly of worshipers to, to join him in all of this, only a voice. And this is, this is what he follows. <clears throat> and um, 
hear the sense of 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by, not by sight. This is kind of the territory that we're in. <clears throat> so it's helpful then to understand what Jesus is saying in terms of what a seed actually is. You know, I mean, it's an embryo. It contains all that's necessary to sustain its life uh, during the process of transformation, which means God has given us everything we need in Christ through his spirit to live abundantly and bear the fruit of his character in this world. And that is hugely uh, significant to understand. God has put into us everything. So when you know, Paul writes in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, where it's God uh, who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's because God knows what he's put in you. And he hasn't put more in you than he's put in me or any, anyone else. He's, he's, we all have that same uh, seed, you know, that same life within us. And so, it, it, it's it's more the idea of the appropriation of the agency that he's that he's given to us. Do we rely on ourselves to live our new life, or on the empowering of the spirit? So the transformation from self reliance to spirit dominance. So you have this self reliance or spirit dominance, and that transformation is a lonely one. So um, w once you've learned and then condition to a certain way of living, and then to transition to a completely different way of living toward a different set of outcomes. This, this is gonna require, I mean, what would that require? What would that require to, to change you or to become changed that way? And this is because we are transitioning from a set of this world physical operations or disciplines you know, a disciplined kind of oriented life uh, to a set of other world spiritual dynamics, which I would say instead of disciplines uh, would be uh, permissions, <laughs> permissions, because if it's passive, it's more yielded. You, you yield, you, you permit, you, you allow. And I, I, I think this is where Paul was saying, you know, work this out. It's, it's God that is at work in you. Uh, and so uh, this, this becomes a, a lot of the, 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 the precondition, if, if you will, uh, to yield, not, not to produce, not to produce, but to bear, uh, to yield by yielding over your life. So um, we have to yield control to experience this, uh, certain flow of power or, or work that the Spirit is doing. I think this, this just falls in line with John passages like John chapter 3 and, and verse 8. You know, the wind blows where Jesus is just obser observing, um, or uh, it's observed there that the wind blows where, where it will as you observe it. Um, so it is with, with everyone who is, is born of the Spirit. And then John chapter 7, 35 through, through 37 um, and Ephesians chapter three and, and verse twenty. So we we can we can demand a seed to produce, you know, but until it's planted, it won't release its potential to grow and ultimately become a fruit bearing plant. So the seed transitions to a seedling. Uh, it leaves appear. Photosynthesis begins. But, but even in that, you recognize, I mean, this one, one little verse, Jesus basically blows our mind because you notice that once this happens, this is a totally different, totally different way of uh, receiving nutrients, totally different way of, of existing, total, totally different process uh, begins to, you know, from drawing power from the sun, generating food from a totally different source. So the parable enriches us how living abundantly is distinct from being a seed in the hand. Seed in the hand is alive, but it's inactive. But once it's planted, and now a, a totally, it, it dies, it dies in that regard so that it can 
begin to live, but live in a different way. But this different way is what Jesus was going to refer to as living abundantly. And in this sense, it's on its way to becoming fruit bearing, a fruit bearing plan. So all that is needed is in the seed and all that is required is to plant the seed. So the seed, in other words, and by this analogy, if you're going to align this with Paul's way of thinking, uh, to, to the seed um, has been created to become something after its own kind, if you, if you will. You think of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, as if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old is gone. The new is come. It is becoming, you know, in this, in this sense. And this is the point of this seed, but it has to be planted. It has to be, you know, planted, covered. But this is notice of, of being covered, I, I think, is, is interesting. Even though the word covered isn't there, but that's the idea. You don't just throw it on top of the ground. You know, but there, there it is. It's, it's covered. I think it indicates a, that the process is, is irreversible. Um, if we look at John, First John chapter three and verse sixteen, just with a sense that, and we we've, we've mentioned this a couple of times about how this process is is irreversible, and involves this this element of of commitment. And one verse that sticks out in my mind is First John chapter three and verse sixteen. And this idea of laying down one's life. And John mentions this, and it becomes critical to his whole case in, in the book of 1 John because it, it sort of becomes critical to the demonstration of sort of a central principle, uh, a central proof of a characterization, if you will, of... of um, evidence, let's say, of, of being born again. First John 3, 16, we know love by this, that he, being the Lord, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And this idea of commitment is here. The idea of commitment in, in the sense that um, we, we must measure our sense of commitment by the cross, which is what he's saying here. He laid down his life for us. This is a reference to how did he do that? He did that at the cross. And so we measure our sense of commitment by the cross. And you, and you, you say, well, how so? Because this is what we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And so the verb there uh, means to be indebted to someone. And John is using the verb metaphorically for the believer's obligation to love based on uh, the capacity to love that we possess. And so we possess this love through, um, I think, a few different ways. One is we possess this love through the agency of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, uh, for example, and we cited this verse countless times, but he says, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So God's love for us or to us this, this way uh, is something that sh that's diffused uh, within us. Um, Paul was referring to this deposit of love that's been given to us, diffused uh, within us, uh, overwhelming us by its influ influence. And then uh, I think this goes along with passages like Romans 8, 14, Galatians 5, 19. Both of these indicate, you know, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. Uh, if, you're, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, this, this, this kind of thing. So by virtue of the, the Spirit's influence being active in us, 
uh, in, the, in this sense, I think is included uh, in this idea that this love being, um, this, this love being poured out in, in us means that this idea we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren means we have this capacity uh, to love in this way. Here's this kind of um, characterization gives us this internal Im impulse to act in accordance with the, the, the agency that, that we have been given. And then I, I think also uh, this capacity to love uh, is possessed through uh, the transformation that we have through the new birth. And John goes on to talk about this in the next chapter in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and following, where he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And you can continue to read through this in, entire section where he makes this, this case. And so by virtue of the new birth alone, this is just central. This is a, an aspect or a characterization of the new birth. And then I would add a third that... Uh, this capacity to love we possess through the standard of the cross. Just going back to Romans chapter 5, uh, after verse verse uh, 5 of that chapter, and then you keep going down to verse 8, that God demonstrated his own love to us in that while we were still sinning, we could say, or while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we have the standard of the cross there. In John chapter chapter 15 and verses 7 and following, uh, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be will we be done to you. And this in that parable of the of the vine and the branches, and my father is glorified in this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Notice how that love is, is central to this now. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Now, this is, a, this is a characterization now. He's saying not a qualification, but he's, he's speaking about those that, um, those that are, his, are his followers. Just, just as much as um, he... He is the, the son of the father and, and has acts in a certain way, so also his followers will behave in a certain in a certain way. And then in verse 13 he says, Well, greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I if you do what I command you, so on and so forth. So he's he's you know, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. This is the essence of, of what it is to be his, his disciple. So here's the, the, this standard of the cross, um, in other words. And this is all, always the, the, the case um, that, that, you know, if you, if you say, well, um, how, how is love... Um, to be measured in the Christian life. It's always by the standard of the, of the cross. And then the, uh, the capacity to love we possess through the expectation of discipleship. And here is the mindset of, of absolute surrender we see in John chapter um, 21, for example, and verses... 15 through 19, for example, again, uh, focusing on this, this issue of, of love. Uh, Jesus' exchange demands of Peter to relinquish his hold on life in deference to following the path of, of discipleship. For example, um, 15 through 19, where they uh, are exchanging back and forth, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he's questioning uh, uh, Peter's Peter's love for him, uh, using um, you know the Greek verb verb agapao, and of course Peter is going to answer back phileo, and whether or not these are synonymous terms to him uh, or not, the first two times 
uh, Peter is going to answer back with, you know, Jesus saying, well, you know, I, just just for sake of, of simplicity, Jesus can be saying, do you love me unconditionally? Peter can be saying, well, you know, I, I love you as a brother. And then the third time Jesus says, do you love me as a brother? You know, just even questions that kind of love. I'm not sure that's exactly how the, the exchange is, is going back and forth. But what um, Jesus is basically telling him is that you need to follow me on the path of, of selfless denial. Uh, in other words, um, you need to apply this same love to, uh, to others. This is the standard, you know, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, tend, tend my sheep. It is, this, it is this same kind of love that is, uh, you are to ex extend to others. So this is this, uh, and, and what I'm saying is he finishes with what? Um, follow me. This is, this is the last, last exchange that he has. Follow me in this, in this particular um, act. So um, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is not a um, suggestion. This is a, a present imperative in the indicative mood. This is about as strong as you can say it uh, in the Greek language. Um, and so he is calling upon them to lay down their life um, in, in this sense of, of absolute uh, surrender and uh, total, total commitment um, to him. So more we could say about that from, from what Jesus from what Jesus says uh, in this, these few, uh, or this, this exchange here in John chapter 12. But I wanted to go and just spend maybe the rest of our time uh, highlighting some, uh, if, we, if we had to ask the question, well, what would that look like? Uh, what would it look like if one was uh, surrendered? What, like what, what would be some signs of that or some indications of that? And I could give a short list of that, perhaps, uh, not suggesting that it's definitive, but just to try to offer maybe, and I've got about 11 of these, and these are just... Um, if, if you wanted to try to imagine, if you were, it, it, if you were um, fully surrendered, you know, and how these are worded or, or what, but um, I would just suggest, this isn't like how to be. So I don't, I don't know that you can do that. I, I really don't know that you can do that and say, oh, this is, these are not steps. This is like, oh, how to be, absolutely surrendered. I think that would be a big mistake because that would, that would be to suggest, again, that the self can defeat itself. Um, so I'm uh, just going to suggest that this is what it, this is what it looks like. Um, so I say, first of all, there has been a number one, uh, and this would be from Romans chapter 12, one and one and two, and we'll just see where we get to it in this. But Romans twelve one and two, that there has been a decisive placing of your life at the altar of sacrifice to be put to death as a free will offering to God. So um, I can't I can't say um, place your life at the altar to be so. This is, there has, you know, there has been a decisive placing of your life at the altar of sacrifice to be put to death as a free will offering to God. You say, well, what in the world does that mean? But you have to look at what Paul is saying here in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And he says, therefore, I urge you, brethren. So imagine Paul is writing to this little group here in this room this morning. And he's saying, hey, hey, everybody. So I want to, I want to, the word is to, to exhort you. So he's encouraging. I want to encourage y'all. I want to encourage y'all 
I want to encourage everybody, um, not command you. So this is verse one. He's, he's not issuing a command here in verse one. There's no commands in verse one. No commands. He's encouraging. And he's encouraging based on, plural, the mercies of God. And I want to encourage you to do something. This is what Paul is saying. Based on the mercies of God. And how far back he goes with that? You know, is this the previous couple chapters? Is this all the way back to beginning? Just based on everything God's lavished upon you in your salvation, uh, in just squaring everything up with him and bringing you to this wonderful place. But just if you can imagine, because he doesn't say mercy singular. He says mercy is plural. So just imagine all of that. Um, but he says to present. And that word present... Uh, means to to place make something available to somebody else for somebody else's use so to take your hands off of it so if you're gonna if you're gonna loan something to somebody or give something to somebody let's just say give something let's just let's not loan it that's probably a bad word but let's say let's give something to somebody here it is it's yours take it you take your hands off of it take your mind off of it it's just it's gone it's gone. It's out of your hands. It's out of your hands. Not to be taken back. Sounds like that seed leaving the hand. It's not coming back. You're not going to dig it up out of the soil, put it back in the bag. It's, it's gone. So to present what? Your, your bodies, um, but to present your bodies at living, holy, acceptable. Those three things. Now that's something God has already done just like that seed. So that seed already has all the life inside of it, already is pre-packaged, got everything it needs, but it's got to be planted. So um, the living, holy, acceptable, that's the seed. It, Paul has just identified the seed. But the problem is, that seed hasn't been what? Presented. Hasn't been offered. Hasn't been sacrificed. So it's got to be presented. And this is what he's talking about. The presented means it's got to leave the hand and be put, put at the altar. So that's that decisive. But, he, but here again, he's, he's encouraging. He's encouraging. Why in the world it's not a command? I, I can't I can't tell Paul, but it, the command doesn't come to verse two, the two commands. But this is an infinitive. You know, he's just uh, do this to to present. So everything is set. Everything is set. Um, just uh, and offer it. Offer it. So this is, this is the, um, there's an understanding there, you know, ho however to expand on this, this thinking. We could just say there's a decisive placing or we could say there is an, there's an understanding. There's an understanding. And I suppose as you, as you go through your, your day, your living my life's not my own. You know, my life is, you know, I, I've yielded this over. See, it's a whole change of a mindset if you know that you've laid down your life. It's a whole, don't you think? I mean, it's a whole different way of thinking. It's a whole different mindset um, if you know that you are laid down, you are conquered, you are not calling the shots, you are not on the throne. Somebody else is on the throne. So that's what goes into this, but then he gets to verse two, don't be conformed, but be transformed. Those, those two things, stop being pressed into the mold of this world, he says. These are passive imperatives, passive imperative. He doesn't say, don't press yourself, he says, Stop allowing your, 
Stop allowing the world to shape you into its mold. That's the idea of, of the verb there. But allow the renewing of the spirit to shape you. Do you see how that works? So you have two, two potential influences to which you could yield. And one is just allow the world. These are both passive. Inf these are two active influences that are concurrently at work. And one is external and one is internal. And you could allow yourself just to be shaped by the world, or you could allow yourself to be influenced by the spirit. But these are not um, coextensive. These are not contemporaneous. Which one's it going to be? And so this is, this is the idea here. You've got to make a choice. You've got to take a stand and what's it going to be? So when you put the negative particle in there, you're going to, it's, Paul is like saying, and he could be really, really forceful here, depending on how you understand Paul's persona. He could just say, stop it already. You know, he really could. He could, he could just be here in, in verse two and say, stop. He could get really paternalistic and say, stop. Stop being conformed. Stop being worldly. Stop acting like the world. S start um, showing. Stop behave or start behaving like you are the children of God. You know, <laughs> I don't know how you put it. That's the that's the substance of it. So there's a lot there in Romans 12, 1 and two, and this is where Paul is heading. Like a second thing. Uh, would be, um, so that's with placing, that, so somebody that's surrendered isn't somebody that's thinking about this, you know, is, isn't somebody, it's, it's, that's the mindset. That's the mindset and the seed, the seed takes over, you know, that the seed drives all that. You're not sitting there thinking, 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 oh, let me think now, wait a minute, I have to figure this all out. No, no, this, the behavior take, takes over. Um, but a second thing is, uh, there exists a, a prayer driven unrest regarding occasions when life situations, relationships, attitudes become misaligned with the altar of sacrifice. So let, let's just rattle off that one again. So you got the whole altar of sacrifice thing, meaning, um, there it is, presenting, here's me, presenting myself. We're, we're unfamiliar with altars and sacrifices, but not, not in this particular day. Well, let's say here, hands off my life, giving it over to God. I give it up as a, uh, back in those, back in ancient times, a free will. Of, there were two types of offerings at least, but at least one category you had to offer. You owed it. If it was a sin offering, then you were required under the law to give in kind some animal that had to die, um, and that cost you something because that animal had value, and you had to give that animal. That animal was put to death by the priest. But what if, what if you just wanted to offer an animal as, as worship to God, just as a free will worship offering? Then, boom, you could take that same animal, offer it. Um, so today, you know, people will give an offering, they'll reach in their wallet, and here's, here's money. Here's, a, here's an offering. Here's a free will offering. But this is, this is somebody's life, life that they're offering. I, pre, I present this. I'm presenting it. I'm, hand, I'm handing it over. Uh, freely, I, I give it over. Now, here, here is this. Um, what what happens when uh, you wouldn't think of taking that back? But what happens when um, you know, we, we would think of that animal coming off of that 
altar. We wouldn't think of that. We wouldn't think of images like that. But in essence, um, when our relationships or attitudes become misaligned with that sacrifice, you know, those two can't coexist. So if I'm sacrificed, if I'm, if I'm living a life where my decisions, where my attitudes, um, all of these types of things, my behaviors are not aligned with um, this surrendered life, then um, this is, this is going to cause a unrest, in other words. So I, I think of a passage like Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41, where Jesus, this is the night uh, where he is in the garden, and he's going to tell us, his disciples, uh, watch and pray. You remember, this is three occasions, and they're falling asleep, falling asleep. And he says, you, you can't watch with me one hour. And so, but, but I think, I mean, it's worth looking at the, at the passage, but um, so he, verse 39, he went a little beyond them. And this is the garden of Gethsemane. He's just done the upper room discourse. He's gone the Kidron Valley up the Mount of Olives. He's, he's there, he's gonna be betrayed all of these events where he's going to go to the cross. He knows everything before him. It's going to be horrific, but he's going to pay for the sins of humanity. And he's saying, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain, remain here and keep watch with me. Now, now this is going to be a, a significant experience for him. And the idea of these disciples remaining vigilant with him. And yet he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. This just shows to me the inherent weakness that we have in our inherent inability to maintain this type of spiritual vigilance. It, it just exists. And so, what does he say to them? But watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Which is what he says in verse 41. So two commands, watch and pray, or you'll enter into temptation. The spirit is willing. That can be lowercase s or uppercase s, but I'd say lower lowercase, right? So uh, the flesh is weak. Unless we understand that, so th there's this idea of a, this prayerful un unrest that somebody who is surrendered, which they really didn't know what they were getting into. They really didn't know what was going on. But somebody who's surrendered is, is someone who has this sort of prayerful vigilance about their walk with the Lord. And again, these aren't steps or how to these are just sort of indicators that somebody is in that place of surrender because you are, you're, you're, you're brought to a, a, a place of brokenness, you know, if there are departures, you're, you're just, you're just there, you know, and, uh, and I think um, maybe that takes us to the, to the a third area, which is this confessing departures from the altar. We're just sort of staying at this, this altar for a place myself there. And then I'm, I'm prayerfully, you know, in this mindset of being vigilant uh, about my life because I know who I am, you know, kind of, kind of mentality. And, and third, you know, confessing departures from, from the altar, you know, when these things happen uh, and, and, you know, confessing this immediately to, to just seek realignment, restoration of fellowship, reduce the frequency of this, of this cycle. Um, 1914 of, of Psalms, I think, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know, because if they're not, who in the world's running the ship? 
Search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my anxious thoughts, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way ever. Let's see if there be a way of pain in, you know, something, you know, but search me, know me, try me. These are the kinds of things that if, if this is on the forefront, then it, 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 it keeps you ever, ever watchful um, monitoring, you know, it's sort of like your own personal security cameras, you know, monitoring your, your spiritual condition. And then um, from 1 John chapter 1, you know, in verse 9, um, if, you, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's a a conditionality there, you know, except in the case of he is faithful. That's not a condition. <laughs> that's, that's always true. Uh, but the idea that uh, in our fellowship, in our fellowship with him, you know, that this is the, the person that is surrendered is the one that values fellowship with God as the be all and end all. It, you know, like you, you know when something is wrong and it just crushes you when that communion isn't there. The person that is not surrendered isn't even aware, can't even, isn't even sensitive to the voice of God. It's just insensitive to that, insensate, I should say, uh, to that. And, and so this idea so, so if, even if you're looking, for example, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, you'll see, for example, contrasting categories. And the one that is characteristic of the um, one who's in fellowship with God is if we walk in the light, as he, him, he himself is in the light. If we confess our sins um, and, and so on. These these are these are the ones who are are in in fellowship with God, and so this is what it means when it says if we confess our hamalageo is the verb, and it just means to to say the same thing to agree with God, and say God I want to live in harmony with you, and and so you're you're in, you're 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 in such a close walk with Him that. It's, it's think of somebody that you that you love so dearly and tenderly that even the slightest offense with them, it's like, you know, you, you bump into them. It's like, oh, oh, excuse me, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, you know. This, this is how you are with God, you know. You're you're just. It's not like, oh, oh, my word, the relationship's over, you know, because I bumped into you. No, no, no. It's not like. It's just like this is how you are with God. You have this just tender, sweet kind of relationship, and and you are. Um, just enjoy that that fellowship. You know, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord. You know, and and we're we're these clods. You know, we're, <laughs> we are these imperfect uh, human beings. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxious. You know, are we prone to worry? You know, are we prone to doubt? Are we prone to, to fears and all these things, which are nothing more than saying, God, I don't trust you. God, I don't, you know, all these types of things. When, when in fact, we don't mean that, you know, if these are just our, our, our weaknesses, but to be quick to confess those and to, you know, forsake those, those, those kinds of things. So that, that's just a sort of a, brief introduction to it, to a short list there uh, that are kind of centered around that, that altar analogy that I think that, that Paul uses, and we can, you know, plow on with that a little, a little bit more. Um, where I would go, where I would, I'll, I'll tell you where, I, where I'm, where I'm going ever inching along a little bit in case you want to look, um, where I go from that, um, I, I, I take a peek, uh, if you want, just if you want to play around this week, I take a peek back at like first Samuel 15. Um, take a look at a bad example in Saul because you got partial a little bit. That's, that's a horrific example. If you want to show somebody where the wheels come off, 
just the wheels come off. Take a look at Saul in 1 Samuel 15, right? Because Saul, Saul actually uh, builds a monument to self, right? I, I think this is just a, such an unbelievable example, right? He goes out and he builds a monument to himself. <laughs> King Saul, right? Uh, but, but it's a sad, 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 tragic, tragic uh, uh, account. Um, I'm going to take that, contrast that with 118.27 of Psalms, you know, buying the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. I think it's a great <clears throat> contrast between those two. But then go to Galatians, go to Galatians 5 and 6, Galatians 6, where you have um, sowing to the flesh, sowing to the spirit. I think those are good you know, and then ask the question, what does it mean? Because those are participles. What does it mean to the one characterizations of two categories? Not, not that a believer can either be sowing to the flesh or so. That's not what he's saying. Um, this is sort of like uh, the, the law of sin and death would be sowing to the flesh. Well, you know, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is sowing to the spirit. But um, you have to ask yourself, what is it? What does it mean? to live a life where you're sowing to the spirit. What is that? What does that look like? You know, that, that's the question you have to ask and then look at it in context, back up and look at chapter five, especially which says, walk in the spirit, live by the spirit, keep in step with the spirit, works of the flesh are these, works of the spirit are these. So it's a little bit, we're still, still really not out of this part of it um, yet. And we'll sort of progress progress accordingly. Um, so, the end for today. Yeah. Lord, thank you for uh, helping us see a little bit further uh, down the road, but more importantly, uh, teach us to humbly place ourselves at your feet and, and learn that it's okay to stay there, that we don't have to, you know, stand up and and go anywhere that we can be quite comfortable there at your feet, find rest there, find peace there, find safety there, find protection there, find all of our needs met there, find uh, answers to all our questions there, find wisdom, find direction, provision. Uh, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your care, uh, your consolation, your comfort. Uh, protect us uh, uh, through the week. Uh, bless uh, Rich in his travels as he makes his way back perhaps sometime this week and uh, uh, give us a, a good week till we're uh, gathered uh, here again in your good time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>